You can turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 11. While you're turning there, you know, it was the great Christian writer C.S. Lewis who once made this observation that God whispers to us in our pleasures, He speaks to us in His creation, but He shouts to us in our pain. It is His megaphone to rouse a sleeping world. Well, if you've been paying attention to current events <laughs> to any extent, you know there's been a whole lot of shouting going on over the last year. Boy, you want to talk about a set of circumstances that has turned all of our lives upside down, not just here in this community, the state, the nation, the entire world. The COVID-19 epidemic has done uh, incredible damage to the lives of people and has inflicted, quite frankly, an awful lot of pain. But with that pain has come confusion. There are all kinds of people out there asking questions, dare I say, spiritual questions that maybe had never dawned on them before. Questions like, where is God in all of this? Those who've lost loved ones, what happens to people after they die? Those who look at what's going on in the world and are just seeing the foundation shaken, is there anyone I can trust and not have them let me down? Well, when we see questions like these being asked, there's some people that will think it's the worst of times, but believe it or not, in a sense, it can be the best of times. The book of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, the Lord says that he works all things together for good for those who love him who are called according to his purpose. Now notice that doesn't say that all things are good, but it does say that God can even take the most extreme circumstances and turn them around as an opportunity to change lives and to change lives in a positive and a beautiful way if we know how to take advantage of it. This morning, we're going to get up close and personal with Jesus dealing with a similar, similarly troubled time, similarly troubled people asking similarly troubling questions. And we're going to see how the Lord answers the questions, especially of those who describe themselves as being spiritual seekers in our day. If you're watching this or here with us uh, uh, presently, and you are a person who maybe knows some things about God, but doesn't really know God personally. The Lord has some very special things He wants to say to you this morning. And if you're a person who does know the Lord, I think there's going to be a real challenge God has for us. Not to just duck and cover. Not just to look at how we can survive these days or pray for rapture. But rather, how we can become equipped to be able to meet people who are seeking answers to serious spiritual questions and be able to answer those questions in a way that not only impacts their minds, but their hearts as well. So let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us as we follow Jesus in some very familiar territory this morning. Lord, thank you so much that your word is so real and relevant to us. And it's amazing how the same questions the same attitudes that we see in our day and age were alive and kicking and doing land office business when you were walking here on earth. Jesus, we pray that you would show us your wisdom in answering these questions and give us similar wisdom. If we're seeking uh, to find answers spiritually, I pray that your wisdom would answer the questions of our heart. And Lord, if we have found you as our answer, I pray that you would use this time to equip us to be able to take those beautiful truths you've sown in us and be able to share them with others in this world so desperately in need of your touch, of your love, of your strength. Thank you, Lord, for using us in this high and holy purpose. Lead us now into your truth, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you've been with us in our study in Luke chapter 11, you know that the ministry of Jesus is rapidly coming to an end. Jesus has months, perhaps, maybe even less than that, before his date with destiny in Jerusalem. 
Even though we're only halfway seemingly through the book of Luke, uh, the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion are going to become more and more front row center as we go through the book of Luke. And just as Jesus' uh, time of crucifixion and resurrection was drawing near, we saw how the opposition to Jesus' ministry was also growing by leaps and bounds. Jesus was opposed by the religious rulers of his day for uh, a couple of reasons. First of all, he didn't play ball with their steel-reinforced spiritual sensibilities. He showed how they were following the traditions of men rather than the truth of God. But secondly, the crowds hung on Jesus' every word. The religious leaders of that time were losing their sway over the public imagination, and that threatened them like nobody's business. And so the opposition to Jesus was growing, and the interest in Jesus was growing. And that's where we pick things up in Luke chapter 11 and verse 29. There we read this, And while the crowds were thickly gathered together, he began to say, This is an evil generation. It seeks a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Now notice Jesus' uh, situation is described here. The crowds were thickly gathered together around him. Now I think that's fascinating because that word translated thickly gathered is only used here in the entire New Testament. A.T. Robertson, the great Greek scholar, said that the nuance of that word, thickly gathered, carries the idea, well, of a real mob scene. I don't know if you've ever been in a mob scene, a place where people are panicky, out of control. Uh, I don't know if Jesus had an ushering ministry, but clearly at this point, they would be absolutely overwhelmed. There are people pushing, there's people shoving, there's people reaching, there's people yelling, all with one goal in mind, to try to get a piece of this person, Jesus, who they wondered whether he was going to be the Messiah or not. So this panicky situation created by overflow crowds, oh, overflowing crowds. If there's one thing we pastorally types love, it's overflowing crowds. You know, we tend to sometimes confuse a genuine work of God with overflowing crowds. But Jesus didn't take that bait. Even though the crowds were massive, almost to the point of being unruly, he said, this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. Now, I call your attention to that word seek there that we find in the Bible because it's a loaded word. You know, we hear today about seeker-sensitive churches. We hear about spiritual seekers in our day and age. And in our culture, let's face it, if you say to somebody, I am a seeker of truth, well, you're going to probably be looked upon with a certain amount of respect. People are going to be saying, wow, you know, a seeker of truth, that's really great. You know, you're, you're, you're on this noble quest to find out what the answers to the big questions of life are all about. And that's okay as far as it goes. But you ever notice something about these uh, people who describe themselves as those are seekers of truth? They never seem to be finders of truth. You know, it's almost like it's more noble to look than to actually be successful in the endeavor. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, if someone uh, gave me a chance to uh, say sign on as a member of the crew of uh, one of those uh, treasure hunting expeditions you see on, say, the Discovery Channel in the Caribbean. Oh, we're going to go looking for pirate gold, you know, a sunken Spanish galleon. We find this. There's a billion dollars worth of gold. And, you know, oh, wow. Do you want to go along? Well, sure. You know, why not? We'll all split it among the crew. Could you imagine how disconcerted you'd be if you started off? Say, okay, well, where are we going? Well, we have no idea. We're just going to sort of float around here. We're going to cruise around. If we happen to bump into a treasure ship, then, you know, so much the better. I'd be like, are you kidding? Yeah, it's like seeking is fine, but seeking to no purpose is just a pleasure cruise, right? It's not going to really get you anywhere good. You might enjoy the buffet, but that's about as far as it's going to go. How interesting that 
those who are seekers seem to be admired in our culture. But if you come to somebody and say, you know what? I was a seeker and I actually found the truth. <laughs> People look at you like you, know, you just burped at the dinner table or slurped your soup. It's not like a party foul or something to actually say that there are answers to these big questions out there. Well, the fact of the matter is uh, that's kind of the attitude that was involved there. But, but even more deeply, when Jesus carry, uh, uses the term seek, an evil generation seeks a sign. The word here really is loaded in the original language. It, it carries the idea uh, in our language of someone who seeks a favor from somebody. In other words, they're looking for somebody, but they've got an agenda. And if you don't meet that agenda, well, all bets are off. You see, Jesus saw through this. In fact, Jesus went out of his way to combat this idea of seeking after the Lord, but with an ulterior motive in mind. You know, think about John chapter 6, the famous miracle that Jesus did of feeding the 5,000, uh, just men, not counting the women and children, probably a crowd of 15,000 people with a few loaves and fishes. Boy, you want to talk about a crowd pleaser. You want to talk about two thumbs up. People were like, this is awesome. This is just like Moses, uh, God feeding the people with bread in the wilderness. We'll never have to go to work again. And when Jesus saw, we're told in John chapter 6, that the people were ready to make him king by force, he withdrew from them, went across the Sea of Galilee. In fact, when the day broke and the people saw that Jesus was gone, they beat feet, they ran a 10K around the north side of the Sea of Galilee, came to the other side and said, Master, when did you get here? Jesus answered and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, same word, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. <laughs> what Jesus was saying is, uh, guys, you're here because you got a free lunch. That's not what I'm here to do. I'm the bread of life. I'm the one who can satisfy not your stomach, but your heart. Well, they weren't interested. In fact, the more Jesus pressed the point, we were told in a really sad address in Scripture, John chapter 6 and verse 66, believe it or not. In that moment, most of his disciples turned away and were following him no more. Ah, who can hear this? This is what we signed up for. So Jesus sees this crowd. They are there because they got an agenda. Probably because they'd heard about his power, they heard about his miracles, they were thoroughly sick and tired of life under the steel-reinforced sandal of imperial Rome. They wanted somebody that was going to kick the Romans out and restore the throne of King David. And that's what their agenda was. And so they were seeking a sign, if you will. They were looking for God to do something, but only if God would do something on their terms. I, I want to emphasize to you how practical and how dangerous this attitude is and really how pervasive it is. H have you ever gotten involved in spiritual things and you kind of had an agenda in the back of your mind? I mean, it's a very easy thing to fall into. Some people will say, well, I'm going to start going to church because, you know, maybe, you know, it'll be good for business. Or I'm going to start going to church because it'll be good for my relationship. Or I'm going to go to church because, you know, maybe you know, just maybe it's uh, going to be good for my kids or, or something along these lines. We have, we have these agendas in mind aside from simply seeking the Lord. You know, some people will go to church and start saying things like this. Well, you know, I'll go to church and I'm sure if I go to church, I'll get a bigger refund from the IRS this year. You know, I'll, I'll go to church and I'll be able to find a parking place downtown. That'll be a miracle uh, when I go to work tomorrow. I'll go to church and, and things will be going my way. And when things don't, when the parking space isn't there, so to speak, people get mad. Yeah, I, I have run into people who've described themselves as ex-Christians. And, and the reason they describe themselves as ex-Christians is they will say something like this to me. Well, I tried Jesus and he didn't work for me. 
It didn't work for you. What do you mean he didn't work for you? Did you use the recommended dosage? I mean, what do you mean he didn't work for you? Well, they're putting their cards on the table. I wanted God to answer my prayer in this way. He didn't do it. I'm out. That's the kind of seeking we're talking about here. And may I gently but firmly tell you something. God will never endorse that kind of seeking. He will never bless you to keep you satisfied, to keep you on the string, so to speak. He's never going to start taking orders from you because he's the Lord and you're not. So here we see Jesus dealing with this because this is an evil generation. It seeks a sign. And if I'd been Jesus and thank the Lord, I'm not, I would have said, talk to the hand, I'm out. But Jesus takes it a step further. He said, no sign will be giving to, given to it, except, now I call your attention to that word, except, I think it is so amazing how patient, how kind, how long-suffering our God is to deal consistently with clowns like us. He goes, I know you've got all kinds of bad motivations here. I know you're going to try to dictate terms to me about what kind of signs we're going to be doing here. Uh, I'm not going to do it. But I am going to give you a series of signs that will be sufficient to show any honest inquirer that what I'm saying is true. Notice the first sign that Jesus lays out here. He says, no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah became a sign to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Okay, what is the sign of Jonah? Now, when you hear the name Jonah, what runs through your mind? Sunday School 101, right? You know, cutting out little cardboard things of, uh, you know, big whales with spouts and Jonah going in and, and, and all. Uh, you know, that's, that's really what we think of. And quite frankly, the book of Jonah is kind of a lightning rod for skeptics. Now, how can you expect me to believe the Bible? Jonah swallowed by a whale. Come on. Not like that thing in Disneyland, you know, you see with a big whale with the eye that looks at you or thing that we walk by. No, you know, it, but notice Jesus says, you're going to get the sign of the prophet Jonah. What is the sign of the prophet Jonah? Well, flip over uh, a book in your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. In Matthew chapter 12, and uh, if you're really interested in digging into where we are in Luke chapter 11 and, and seeing the ministry of Jesus in HD uh, quality, uh, I highly recommend reading through uh, the book of, of uh, Matthew chapter 12 sometimes this week because it will give you a lot of insights and nuances that you don't get uh, in the book of Luke, and you get a fuller picture here. In verse 38, of Matthew chapter 12, we're told, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now notice Jesus' whole interaction is prompted by the fact that these scribes and Pharisees, his sworn enemies, are demanding a sign from him. And he answered and said, an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. No sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So far, so good. Exactly what we see in Luke. But then this additional detail. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What Jesus is saying is, I'm going to give you a sign. In fact, it's a bigger sign than any sign you could possibly imagine. My death and resurrection after three days. Now, <laughs> I know when people hear about Jonah, uh, you know, like I say, the fairy tale stuff, but how could something like that possibly happen? Well, you know, we could get into a, a whole rabbit trail about that. Suffice it to say, there's all kinds of sea creatures out there that are large enough and have a digestive tract big enough to be able to handle swallowing a, a man whole at that time. I remember going to SeaWorld a few years back, and it was uh, not long after uh, the movie Jaws was out. And they had in a glass case a frozen 15-foot great white shark. And uh, being a, a diver, I was quite impressed with that. Never really wanted to see a great white shark while I was out diving, so it was kind of neat to be able to see this thing. And I'll tell you, the most impressive thing to me about this great white shark was it had its mouth open. And as you walked and you looked straight down the business end of this great white shark, you, you discovered something. 
That great white shark's mouth was large enough for any human being I've ever met to crawl comfortably in, right into the digestive tract. Now, am I saying that this was a great white shark that swallowed Jonah? I don't know. Could have been a whale. Could have been a lot of different candidates. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus took the story, the account of Jonah, very seriously. And when people say the story of Jonah is just a fairy tale, Jesus didn't look at it that way. He rose from the dead. I think I'll take his word for it. So you remember the story. Jonah, uh, a prophet from northern Israel, called by God to minister to the people of Nineveh. Nineveh, the capital city of the hated Assyrian Empire, the, the rising power in the Middle East. Brutal, incredibly barbaric people who, who were so awful to deal with. That if the Ninevites, uh, the Assyrians, came after you and you were a walled city and it became apparent they were going to take over, a lot of walled cities just committed mass suicide rather than to fall into their hands. Not great people. Thoroughgoing idolaters. God says, go preach to them. Jonah says, I'll take that under advisement. Goes to the city of Joppa, gets in a boat, goes the exact opposite direction. He's going to Tarshish, a place that we would associate today with modern Spain. Nineveh, 700 miles that way. Tarshish, 2,000 miles that way. I'd say Jonah was like, ah, forget about it. Well, you know the story. Suddenly, the Lord throws his storm out on the sea. The ship is about ready to be smashed into kindling. The captain of the boat comes down. Jonah's asleep. He's so depressed. He comes down, wake up! Call on your God. Maybe he'll save us. Wow, you know, it's kind of one of those divine appointments. You want me to share with you? Who are you? What's your occupation? Jonah says, oh, I'm a prophet from Israel. I worship the God who made the heaven and the earth and the seas. Now he goes, huh, well, start praying, man. And he goes, no, 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 it won't do any good. He goes, Why not? He said, well, I know this storm has come upon you because of me, because I'm running away from God. And they go, what? He goes, here's what you do. Toss me overboard, the sea will become calm for you. This is the Scott Rich, Richards paraphrase edition, by the way. Sea will become calm for you. And they go, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And they wrote against it. And finally, these Gentiles, right, these non-Jewish Phoenician sea traders who were beneath contempt as far as Jonah's lights were concerned, uh, call on God, right, the true and living God, and say, Lord, uh, we don't want to do this. We're going to toss this guy over. You've done what you please. Toss Jonah over. Sea becomes calm, large sea creature swallows Jonah, delivers him back to the exact place he got off track, right back to Joppa. Interesting, though, and you might want to read through this on your own time, Jonah chapter 2. Jonah describes his experience in the digestive tract of this large sea creature, and he uses a very interesting word to describe it. He talks about it being a trip to Sheol. The place of the dead in Scripture. Well, some people said, okay, well, toss me in a place where it's ooey and gooey and acid coming off the walls and about 108 degrees and it's dark and all that stuff. That's as close to H-E double hockey sticks as I ever want to get. Some people think he was speaking metaphorically. But notice, Jesus said, just as Jonah was three days in the belly of the large fish, so I will be in the heart of the earth. Bible commentators like J. Vernon McGee suggest that the language that uh, Jonah uses indicates that he quite possibly died and was deposited back after three days. Then God resurrected him. Was it an actual death and a resurrection? I think there's evidence to suggest that it was. Uh, you can make the call. But suffice it to say, large fish comes back to Jonah. Blah! There's Jonah up there. Goes to Nineveh. So, what Jesus is saying is this. You all know about Jonah and his account uh, of this great fish. Well, here's your sign, a greater sign than even that of Jonah. I'm going to die. And three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. You are going to know at that point that I say what I mean and mean what I say. Now, understand something. God is completely willing to give solid evidence 
that is more than sufficient to satisfy the actual curiosity of any fair inquirer. God understands something. I think it was Carl Sagan, the astronomer and philosopher and writer, who once coined the phrase, extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Jesus made extraordinary claims. This one, three days in the belly of the earth, I'm going to rise again. Pretty extraordinary. He's just getting warmed up, right? Uh, remember John chapter 14? You know, one of Jesus' disciples, Philip, said, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, Philip, and you haven't known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you realize what an outrageous statement that was? Especially to a Jewish audience that was raised in the Ten Commandments, one, only one God. And what do you say? You're saying, I've seen God? You're, yeah, that's what Jesus was saying. There's no way around it. Now, it's one thing to say you're God. Anybody can say that you're God, right? I remember back during the uh, groovy 80s, uh, there was a spiritual fad that got going. Some of you are old enough to remember this. The New Age movement. Remember the New Age movement? You know, crystals and uh, gurus. And, and uh, there was a great proponent of New Age thinking, Shirley MacLaine, the famous movie actress. She wrote a best-selling book, number one on the New York Times bestseller list, called Out on a Limb. It got made into a movie. And Shirley's breakthrough spiritual moment, her moment of enlightenment happened when she stood on the beach in Malibu in front of her palatial home. I can think of, uh, you know, worse places to have a spiritual breakthrough. She's standing on the beach in Malibu. She's looking at the waves and she started yelling, I am God at the waves. She said that was what changed her entire life when she realized that she was God. Well, it's one thing to claim it, Right be another thing for Shirley to walk, say, from Malibu to Catalina Island and prove it. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Jesus' resurrection validates every extraordinary claim, and there are multitude, multitudes of extraordinary claims Jesus made by rising from the dead. You know, Professor Thomas Arnold, uh, who was the author of the famous History of Rome and appointed to the Chair of Modern History at Oxford, was an expert at judging evidence and verifying historical facts. He said this, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who've written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given to us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. If you are a spiritual seeker, you owe it to yourself to look into the evidence for the resurrection. I highly recommend reading Josh McDowell's small little booklet called More Than a Carpenter. It will give you an awful lot to think about. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, then that means that every claim Jesus made about himself, and get this, everything that Jesus had to say about life, death, and the afterlife is absolutely true. If Jesus is risen from the dead in a moment of history, gang, we should run, not walk, to our nearest Bible. And guess what? As Christians, it changes the whole equation. Why do I tell you guys about Jesus so much? Why do we spend time telling people over and over again in this church about how to know Him in a personal way? Because this isn't my thing. This isn't just what I'm into. This is what God has done in history. And we need to proclaim it. People desperately need to hear this. So the, the first sign that Jesus is going to give to any seeker, if you want to find your way to God, this is the sign, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. But Jesus isn't going to stop there. Boy, you talk about a generous God. Not just the sign of the resurrection. Look at verse 31. The queen of the south will rise in the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Oh, boy, another radical statement of Jesus. A greater than Solomon is here? Wisest guy who ever lived? Yeah, Jesus said, I'm wiser. Why? Because the one who made the human brain is wiser than anyone who possesses one, right? That's what he's saying. He goes, a greater than Solomon is here. 
Now, notice this, this uh, discussion about the Queen of the South. If you want to read more about this, the encounter between Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, as she's also known, is found in the book of 1 Kings, chapter 10, verses 1 through 9. And this woman came a huge long way. The, the country of Sheba, uh, commentators and archaeologists believe, was located at the southern tip of the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. No, by no means an easy journey to go from there all the way up to Jerusalem to meet with King Solomon. She does it because she wants to ask this Solomon guy questions. She wants to find out if he's really all that wise, as, as the rumors suggested. And after her interview, after grilling Solomon on anything and everything she could imagine, she said, man, I had been told about your wisdom, but I had not been told the half of it. You really are the wisest man who ever lived. Jesus says he's even wiser, even wiser. And that tells me something. It tells me that God also has given us a sign, not just of resurrection, but of God's revelation. God has spoken to us in this book we call the Bible. God has given us all the information necessary to understand who God is, what's on his mind, what it means to know him personally, how we can walk with him day by day in this world, and even more importantly, how we can make a soft landing on the other side of this life after we die. These are huge, huge issues. Do you realize what a blessing it is to have the Bible? The Bible is not man's word about God. It's God's word to man. And because of that, that's true. That should give us confidence as believers in sharing it with others. And it should also challenge non-believers to evaluate those claims on that basis. You know, the funny thing about a lot of non-believers I've talked to is they'll make uh, impressive sounding statements and judgments about the Bible without a whole lot of evidence. And this is what I mean. You know, how many people you run into have said something to you like this? Oh, the Bible, it's ancient mythology. It's just a bunch of fairy tales. Next time you hear that, I've got a suggestion for you. Ask them, have you read it? <laughs> Most of the time, they probably haven't. Uh, a friend of mine is a traveling evangelist uh, with uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. Great uh, writer. His book, uh, Give Me an Answer, is really an awesome book on how to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Cliff Connectly, he speaks on college campuses, these open-air evangelistic se settings with you know, the kind of people you'd run into on college campuses. Well, Cliff's sharing away, and this guy stands up in the middle of one of his presentations and says, I think the Bible's a bunch of ancient mythology and myths. And Cliff said, have you ever read it? He says, well, no. No, well, do yourself a favor. Go home tonight, read the book of Isaiah, and read the book of Matthew. And then come back tomorrow and tell me if you think it speaks the truth. No, guy takes off. Cliff never thought he'd see him again. Next day, guy comes back. He goes, Cliff! I read Isaiah and I read Matthew last night. I think it's great stuff. I think it really speaks the truth. And Cliff said, well, are you ready to give your life to Jesus? You want to invite him into your heart? He goes, oh, no, I can never do that. He goes, well, why not? The guy says, well, I have a very active sex life going on right now, and I don't want anything to get in the way of that. You know, funny thing is, every time we're reading the Bible, isn't it funny how the Bible's reading us? You know, we think we're critics of the Bible, but God's Word is an anvil that's worn out many hammers. It's not going anywhere. It has a funny way, though, of revealing the inner secrets of human hearts. You see, God has given us this miracle of the Bible, the miracle of His inspired Word to guide us home. And if God has spoken to us, we should run, not walk, to our nearest Bible. But notice the final piece of evidence, the, the, the final provision of a sign here, not just a resurrection, not just revelation, but also renovation, changed lives. Look at verse 32, the men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed are greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is saying, I am greater than the prophet Jonah. You know, when I saw that, I went, eh, you're not really setting the bar very high. Jonah, remember, the guy that didn't want to share with the Ninevites? He had swallowed by the great fish, barfed up on the coast of Joppa. And, All right, I'll go. You know, you think that after an encounter like that, it might change your heart a little bit, might change your life a little bit. He goes to Nineveh and basically goes into the city and says, Yet! 
40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's all he said. By the way, the word overthrown, same word that is used to describe the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. What he's saying is, you guys are going to the ultimate weenie roast and I like it. That, that's the paraphrase there. 40 days you got. That's it. He went through the city, preached this lame message. <laughs> the, the bare minimum, if you will. Well, there's a reason why the, uh, Jonah and Nineveh has been called the world's greatest revival or the world's worst evangelist. Because with that simple declaration of God's Word, the Holy Spirit moved in such a powerful way that the people, when they heard that, they all started to repent. They were so serious about repenting, people were getting their livestock and putting sackcloth and ashes on the livestock to show God how sorry they were about their sins. Well, you've probably heard the old expression, when the people lead, the leaders will follow. The king hears about it, and even he puts on sackcloth and ashes, declares a fast, don't even let a cow eat anything, to show God how sorry we are about our sins. And we are told that when God saw they had turned from their wicked ways, he relented concerning the calamity which he said he was going to bring, and he did not do it. Now, <laughs> Jonah's reaction to that is another whole story. You know, Jonah was bummed out that he didn't get to see Nineveh get nuked. But the bottom line is this. What Jesus is saying is those people in Nineveh, you know, these Gentiles, these, these people who had no business, no background, knowing about the true and living God, when this one guy comes in and says, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Nine words. God honors that and they all turn, they all change. What Jesus is saying is, <laughs> you guys have had a far greater prophet than a reluctant guy like Jonah dragging his feet, not wanting to be here at all. Jesus willingly left heavenly glory to become a man and walk among us, to not only proclaim the greatest words ever spoken, but to live the most extraordinary sinless life the world has ever seen. He took that sinless life and laid it down on a cruel Roman cross to pay the price for our sins willingly. He told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about the issues of life that we all desperately need to know. And guess what? Still wasn't enough for these seekers. Now, I guess that brings us around to what we need to understand. Changed lives are a great proof of the truth of Jesus. And guess what? There are some people who will never consider the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. I think that's sad, but a lot of people will never do their homework. There's an awful lot of people who will never read a Bible to find out if it's really true or not. But you know what? There's all kinds of people out there that you rub shoulders with on a regular basis that will take a look at your life to see if the message of Jesus is real. The minute you identify with being a born-again Christian, guess what? You are exhibit A to so many people of the reality of Christ. Remember the old living Bible, you know, with the Jesus people on the cover? Guess what? You're that living Bible. Big question is, how good a translation are you? Are you clear? Do people have to make their way through a thicket of old King James to figure out what in the world you're saying? Do they see little bits and pieces and drips and drabs of truth? Or do they see the truth about Jesus because it's working out in your life? Oh, I'm not saying we've got to be perfect, but do people see us in process? We might not be all that God has called us to be, far from it. But at the very least, can those closest to us see that we're not the people we used to be either? That's what God does within a life. And that, perhaps, is one of the most persuasive proofs that Jesus really lives. It's this. He's living in you. Do people see it? Do people know that? Two things I, I leave with you. If you're a seeker of God's truth, you've heard about Jesus, uh, you know, you, you've, you've, you understand some concepts about him, but you don't know him in a personal way. Understand, Jesus is doing all of this that we're seeing in the book of Luke. He is going to go to the cross 
the most excruciating form of, of torturous death the world has ever known for one reason. He loves you. He took your place. He bore God's wrath on that cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven and go free. And all he asks you to do in order to be a part of his forever family is simply receive that gift. Simply receive it as an act of faith. To simply pray and say, Lord, I know I'm never going to make it to heaven by being good enough. I'm not a good person. But I believe that Jesus died for me. And I believe that he rose from the dead. Please forgive my sins. Come into my heart. Make me a brand new person. It's not the words of the prayer that matters. It's the attitude of your heart. The Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved because salvation, like any other gift, you only get it if you receive it. Can I ask you a challenging question? Even those of you who are here with us, you watching online, can you point to a specific time in your life where you made that conscious decision to invite Jesus into your heart? Yeah, the search can be over for you. You can find... The, the love of God to fill that aching emptiness within you, a sense of purpose and meaning, a, a reservoir of love that can change every other relationship that you have. And all God asks you to do is to believe Him, to receive that relationship with Him as a gift. You're here, and you receive that. Well, Scott, you know, I'm, I've come to the end of my search. I, I believe Jesus is all that. What's in it here for me? Well, it's not what's in it here for you. It's what's in it for others. Do you just look at your Christianity as an excuse to hunker down, to hide out in the church, to so surround yourself with believers that you never rub shoulders with those who don't know God and pray for rapture so that you can get out of here as quick as you can? There's one reason you're listening to this message here today, one reason why you're still here, one reason why Jesus hasn't come back yet, because there's still people that need to know about Jesus. And he wants to use you and your life as exhibit A to those seeking that there's an end of the search, that there is a place you can call your spiritual home forever, that God, like the story of the prodigal son, stands with his arms outstretched saying, come home to me. People might never hear it from a pastor. They might never see it in the pages of a scripture, but they can see it personally written on the tablet of the heart of your life. Oh, well, let's pray and ask God to give us that great privilege this morning. Father, I thank you that of all the ways that you could choose to reach the world with this matchless message of who Jesus is and what he's done for us, these amazing signs, these proofs positive that you really are, Lord, the true and living God, whether it's the resurrection, whether it's your revelation, whether it's renovation of a changed life, you've chosen to use us to communicate that to people. And Father, if our Christian lives have become old and cold and stunted, kind of deathly dull, maybe it's because we're not doing what you've called us to do. I pray, Father, that we would turn from that, those of us who belong to you. I pray that you would lead us to pray a, a dangerous prayer, as we begin our days, even tomorrow, Lord, bring across my path one person who needs to know about your love, one person who's lost and hurting and confused, one person who needs to have answers, and, and give me the love and the light of Jesus to share with them. Lord, that's just the kind of prayer you're going to answer. And Lord, I also pray for those who may be watching this here presently or even tuning in, if they haven't made that decision to receive you as their Savior, that this would be their morning, this would be their day. They wouldn't put it off another day. They would just, in the privacy of, of their hearts, call on you and say, Lord, I want that gift of salvation. I want to belong to you. Forgive me. Come into my heart. Make me a brand new person. I give my life to you because I believe you gave your life for me first. Thank you, Lord, for giving us this gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, a, a couple things. You know, as you heard as you came on in, uh, we have these invitation cards we've put together for our Easter sunrise services. You want to get involved in impacting people with the love of Jesus? And give one of these out to a friend, to a coworker, to someone in your neighborhood, and let them know uh, about the service. And invite them and, and ask them uh, to come and say, hey, I'll, I'll sit with you. If you're not comfortable being in church, at least uh, we'll be able to sit there together. 
You know, use this as a tool. We're really praying that the Lord is going to do an amazing work of reaching a lot of people with the love of Jesus. So grab a few of these and don't be afraid to hand them out today. Uh, on maybe one of the least spiritual announcements I can give to you, uh, they're doing a uh, repaving and repainting of the parking lot that direction. The only way out of this place is that way. So don't go that way. You're going to just uh, end up frustrated. When you exit, head towards the Tucson Mountains. You'll be just fine. Let's all stand. Hey, this week, may it be a week of divine appointments in your life. May the Lord show you that there's no such thing as coincidence in the kingdom of God. May he bring you to places and bring people across your path that you can share God's love with. May he give you wisdom and words you never dreamed even possible would come from your mouth. May you see that awesome anointing of his spirit and share out of that glorious overflow. And as you do, may the Lord just, may, perhaps even in the process, bring healing to you, healing to your heart, healing to your worries, healing to your woes by reaching out to others with the love of Jesus Christ. May God give you that blessing this week. In Jesus' name, amen.